In this lecture, we're going to discuss what are known as connected spaces, something we have alluded to before, but we have never defined rigorously. The idea is going to be basically this. Imagine that, uh, and to keep things simple, let's draw pictures in R2. So uh, the idea would be something like this. Here's a region in R2. Something like this we're going to say is uh, connected. And then if you have something like this, let's say, two separate pieces, or maybe more, if you can have three of them, you would say this is disconnected. And by the way, to avoid confusion, if you have a hole in the middle, that's okay. It's it's still in one, it's still in one piece. This is still connected. Uh, the actual terminology, which we're going to talk about later on, is um, when you're talking about whether or not your space has a hole or not, then the terminology is called simply connected. So this is not simply connected. But that's something we'll talk much, much later in the course. Uh, you can see that it's still in one shape, even though it has a hole. So this is what connected means. That's the intuition behind connected. And what we would like to do is we would like to give a rigorous definition for what connected means. And it's a very nice definition. It's, uh, you're going to see it's actually quite simple. So we want to be able to take pictures like this and reformulate them in terms of open sets, namely using topology. Uh, so that we can make rigorous arguments about these kinds of pictures without actually the need to draw pictures, because in more abstract spaces, one cannot necessarily see what's going on anymore. So here is how this works. So here's the idea behind it. So here's the idea. So let's say we have some region, A, sitting inside Rn. Uh, I'm going to start with Euclidean spaces, because that's where our intuition uh, is best used. And then we're going to see how to take these definitions and make them more general to any kind of space. But let's just start with Euclidean space. So if we have some region and the region is disconnected, it's in two pieces. Let's say you have two pieces, or maybe even three pieces. Let's say you have something like this. So let's say all of this picture represents A. Okay, and it does not matter whether or not these like um, regions are open or closed or anything in, or anything else. The idea is still going to be the same. If it's so, A represents like this picture. Let's say represents A, and you can see from the picture that you have different pieces that are separated from each other. So we're talking about things being separated. And if you recall, right, it, it's about separation, right? We, we talked about this thing called separation in a space. So um, remember, we talked about the different types, the different ways you can separate things in space. And then one of them we mentioned, which is the most important type of separation, which is called Hausdorff separation, said it says that if you have two points P and Q, then in the Hausdorff space, you can draw like an open set around one of them, and then you can draw like an open set around uh, another one that contain the two points, but the two open sets do not overlap. And that gives you the idea of separation, that the two things are sufficiently far away from each other. So based on this, you're going to say something very similar. You're going to say that you can find, you can find some open set uh, I, I'm going to draw this without a broken line, but we, we should understand that this is an open set. You can maybe find some kind of open set U that's going to contain all of that. And then maybe you can find another open set, let's call this V, that contains all of that. And the two open sets do not overlap. That's exactly what it means to be separated. There's space in between them. Uh, and you can see what the problem would be. If the space is completely, if, if the space is connected like this, how do you break it into two open sets? Like you're not able to do that because if you use like one open set over here, then because the open sets have thickness to them, you're not allowed to do something like th th this is not allowed because uh, then then you're kind of including this boundary on one but not on the other. So this one will have to be a little bit thicker because it's an open set. But then you see what the problem is. The problem is then they're overlapping with each other. That's where the problem becomes. So if it's connected, then when you try to do this kind of separation, they end up intersecting with each other. So here is this, um, um, a first definition. We're going to improve upon this definition. So here is, let's say, definition. Uh, let's call this a pre-definition. And what I mean is we're just writing this down so that we can make the better definition afterwards. But this is like a good way to start. So let A be a subset of Rn. Okay. And 
we say A is disconnected uh, if and only if if and only if we can find we can find open sets U and V as open subsets of Rn so that the following properties are satisfied. So the first property would be that U and V should not intersect. Then the second property should be that U union V, this together they contain A. That's what we had in the picture. They contain A. And there's the third condition is that you're not doing it in a silly way. So this is the way, like, you can always do something like this. Like, if, if this is A, let's say, you can always do something like this. You can call this U, and then you can call this V. And then you can see from this picture that U, union V, together, they contain A. They do not overlap. But you want to rule something like this out, because V is not actually intersecting A, right? It's kind of silly. Like, it's not doing anything. So that's like the third condition. So the third condition would say that uh, U intersect A and V intersect A are not empty. So they actually intersect. They both individually have something in common with A. That's actually kind of like the Hausdorff condition because in, in the Hausdorff space, if you recall how it goes, you have two points, P and Q, and you're separating them by open sets. But you want the two open sets to actually contain the two points. So you want these open sets to have something. They want You want them to contain something. So this is what, would, what it would mean to be disconnected. So uh, this is the definition. And now, what is, like, what's the problem with this definition? So this is a nice definition. You can see it's actually quite simple. It, it's like you're taking this very visual picture, and you're nicely formulating it just using open sets in a topology with just unions and intersections. So that's actually quite nice. It's a very satisfying definition. But there is a problem with this definition. It, and it's, so there's two problems with this definition. There's two drawbacks with this definition. The first one is um, we are not defining connected, but rather defining disconnected. And you can imagine that we probably care about spaces being connected. You can say that disconnected is an undesirable property, and the real property that we want is the property of being connected. That's probably the nicer property. So what you could say is we define connected as not disconnected. So that's a very convoluted way of defining what it means to be connected. So the connected is what you want to define, and instead you define something uh, bad, which is disconnected, and then you say connected is when it's not bad, when it does not have that bad property. So, uh, I mean, it works, but it's like a very backwards way of doing it. It would be nice if there's like a more direct type of definition that one can use. And the second thing is we are defining what it means for A to be disconnected or connected. So connected would just be the opposite of that, uh, to be um, connected by going into the ambient space Rn, right? Like we're going into Rn. So uh, this A sits in Rn, and we're trying to determine if this subspace is, is disconnected and we're talking about open sets in Rn, you see. And this is a little bit of a problem because imagine for the moment, we, so what we want to do, the actual definition should go like this. Like the actual definition that we want should go like this. We would say instead of let A be a subset of Rn, we just want to say let X be a topological space. And then we say that X is connected if and only if some kind of property is satisfied. We do not want to have open subsets in some larger space. Now, the reason why I write this definition, this pre-definition down, is because this might have been the way you've seen it done in an advanced calculus course, perhaps, if you've taken advanced calculus. So this is a reminder. And also because it helps build up the intuition. So here's the way we're actually going to do it. So I'm going to take down this definition. There's nothing wrong with this definition. It's perfectly fine. But I'm going to take down this definition, and then we'll see the nicer way to do it. So the definition that we're going to act, write down will actually immediately follow from this, but it's a, it's a better way of thinking about it. So here is how this is going to work. So if we have, like, let's say, two pieces, 
and of our A, okay, and this is an Rn again, we have two pieces, and we, we have two sets. We have this U, and then we have this one over here, V. These are two pieces. Then this piece right here, this is U intersect A, right? That, that, that would be this piece right over here. So U intersect A is this piece uh, because A is, this, is both of these pieces. U is this uh, open set. And when you intersect it, you get this. And the other piece would be U intersect A. So it would be this. And let's give this a name. Let's call this U1. Actually, let's call it U prime. And this one should have been V. Sorry about this. This should have been V. And let's call this V prime. And here's what you notice. So observe U prime is open in A. So, op so, if we're, if, so the idea here is we want to forget about Euclidean space because we do not want an ambient space. We do not want a larger space. We want to completely work in A and only A, ignoring the larger space in which A sits. So this is an open set in A. Why is this? Well, because remember how it goes. We've said this before. We've said that that open in A looks like this. It's open in Rn, and then you intersect it with A. That's exactly what we have, because U prime can be written as U intersect A. U is something that's open in the ambient space, and then you're intersecting it with A, and then you're getting, by definition, an open set in the subspace topology. So this is open in A. Furthermore, Furthermore, the complement of U prime in A is, so the complement, so if you do A take away U prime, what is this? So you can see from the picture, A consists of this piece and it consists of this piece. So if you remove this one, you get the other one, you get the other half. So what do you get? You get V prime, right? That would be V prime. So that is V prime. But what's special about V prime? This is also an open set in A. So that's kind of interesting. So, so, so to summarize, U prime is open in A, and its complement is open in A. So if its complement is open, it means that hence U prime is also closed in A. U prime is also closed, right? Because what's the definition of a closed set? It means the complement is open, but the complement of it is V prime. And as you can see over here, V prime is also open. So U prime is, is both open and closed at the same time. So it's a set which is both open and closed simultaneously. So here is the more satisfying definition. So here's the actual, so this is kind of like the motivation for how this definition comes up, but here's the actual definition. Definition. Let X be a topological space, and I'm just gonna write space. So we'll suppress the vocabulary and the symbols even further. So we say, that X is connected. So now we're giving like the positive definition, connected. If and only if the only subsets of X which are open and closed simultaneously, simultaneously, actually write out the word simultaneously are the trivial sets trivial sets so the empty set is open and closed and the entire space is open and closed if those are the only ones if those are the only sets that have that property then the space is connected so the only subsets which are both open and closed simultaneously are the trivial sets because if the space, so again, uh, the reason why this works is because if a space is not connected, so if you have like two pieces, two pieces, 
Then you can enclose this one off in an open set, enclose this one off in the open set. And then the idea is whatever you get, this intersection, you call this U prime, you call this V prime. And then the idea is this thing that you have over here that's an open set, because it's an open set intersecting with X, that's an open set, and its complement is the open set. So when something is disconnected, these pieces are non empty, right? So you're kind of staying away from these two extreme cases. When it's, when it's a connected space, right, the, the way you get a non trivial such set is by splitting the space into two pieces like that. So that's the way the definition goes. Uh, and there is a very funny name to sets that are open and closed. So this is an actual terminology. I know you're going to think that I'm like making a joke out of this, but this is an actual terminology which is used. And uh, I'm a big fan of this terminology because it sounds so ridiculous, but because it sounds so ridiculous, like you never, you never forget. It's like the one thing that no one ever forgets because of how ridiculous it is. So these are called clopen sets, clopen sets. So it's a set which is both open and closed at the same time. This is an actual term. You can look it up on Wikipedia. It's an actual name. And also, if you watch the Hitler learns topology video, when um, his advisors tell him that the empty set is both open and closed at the same time, and then they tell him it's called the clopen sets, that's when he goes absolutely crazy. So um, yeah, it's an actual term. But I like how ridiculous this name is because like people seem to never forget the condition. And maybe that's the way you make math easier. Maybe if we introduced more ri ridiculous words into mathematics, people will just find math easier. There's this like psychological thing that happens that when you come across something very ridiculous, you do not seem to forget it. So maybe that's what math is missing, more ridiculous terms. So uh, X is a space, that's what it means to be connected. So you, you can therefore say X is connected if and only if the only clopen subsets are the trivial subsets. So, and that's the condition. So now that we introduce the definition, uh, let's talk about the real line. Let's talk about the real line. And I want to uh, actually write this down as a theorem because this is actually somewhat important and it's not that easy to prove. I would say one of the directions is easy to prove. The other direction is not that easy to prove. So this is going to be the theorem. So it says this, the connected, the connected subsets of R, so the real line, uh, notice this is not Rn, this is R, the connected subsets. The connected subsets of R are the intervals. The intervals are the connected subsets. So you know what I mean by an interval. So if this, if this uh, represents the real line, a connected subset will look something like this. It's an interval. Maybe the interval is like it includes one point and not the other. That would be fine. Or maybe, maybe the interval is like it goes off, like half of it goes off to infinity something like this, maybe something like that. Or maybe an interval could be like something uh, really silly. It could be just a single point. A single point is technically an interval. It just consists of a single point. Uh, and you can say the empty set is connected for the obvious reason because the only subsets of the empty set is just itself. So automatically, the clopen, the so it's not just that the only, so connected means the only clopen sets are the trivial ones. Well, when you have the empty set, the only, it's not just the clopen sets, but any set is trivial in the empty set. So this is the pictures. So what exactly is an interval, right? This kind of agrees with our intuition. That's the way it's supposed to look like. Of course, R with the usual topology, as we've remarked. So what exactly is an interval? So let's just recall what an interval is. So here's the definition of an interval. So uh, definition, let I be a subset of R. We say I is an interval when it has the following property, when it has the following property. So that property is if P and Q belong to the interval, and x, let's say, is a number between p and q, then x belongs to the interval also. So that's the interval property, right? So th this should make sense, right? If like this line represents an interval, if, if I pick a point p and I pick a point q, 
then if it's an interval, anything between P and Q, uh, let me, sh I, I should have actually added that. And if, so if P and Q belong to I, and if X is some number between P and Q, then that X also has to belong to I. Okay, so that would be an interval. Uh, so anything between them has to belong to I. Uh, a picture of something that would not be an interval is, let's say, like you can see, if it's broken apart like that, you see there's that break over there. So if I pick, if I pick P over here and I pick Q over there, then you can see it does not matter where I pick the X. It does not matter where the X is selected, no matter where you select the X in between these two, it will fall inside the interval. However, if P is on one side, let's say over here, and Q is on the other side, then it actually matters where the X is being selected. So if I select the X over here, that's okay. Here's an X between P and Q, and X belongs to the interval. However, it is conceivable that the X is chosen to be right here. And then you have a number X between P and Q, but X itself is not part of the set. It's not part of I. So this is the interval property that if you pick any two points in the interval, anything between them is in the interval. And of course, the singleton set would be an interval. So something like this. So if this is I, that would be an interval for the simple reason, because this is true vacuously. There's only one point in I. You cannot pick two different points, P and Q, and then consider an X. There's no condition to check. So a singleton set, a set consisting of a single point, will also be an interval. We call it a degenerate interval, and we call the empty set a degenerate interval, but there's still intervals because they satisfy that property. So this is a nice theorem. It completely classifies all connected subsets of R in this very nice way. Uh, let's, let me also make a comment. I'll write it here. So uh, this is a very special classification theorem. Such a classification theorem does not exist for R2. It only exists for R1. It only exists on the real line. Because the real line is simple enough that you have such a classification theorem. The connected subsets of R2 are way too complicated to classify. So the connected subsets of R2 are way too complicated to entirely classify. There's like an uncountable number of different cases that you can have. So just to show you what I mean, if you're drawing pictures in two dimensions, a disk would be connected, a square would be connected, an ellipse would be connected, and then you can have half space. So this is like unbounded space, half space would be connected. Then you can have something, let's say, unbounded going like this would be connected like that. Uh, then you can also have holes. You can have an annulus. So the annulus is the region in between two disks. Or you can have something that goes like this. You can have two, two holes, and that is still connected. Or you can even have a more complicated thing where, let's say, you have your uh, disk, and then you just draw like points that you are removing, and then those points have been removed, and it's still connected. Or you can even have, let's say, a disk, and then you can have like an entire curve that's been removed, and then some points have been removed and then you just fill in whatever is left over, and that is connected. And then you can start doing that with other kinds of regions. And the point is, there is no simple way to classify how all of those sets look like. They're just way too complicated. So we do not have a classification theorem for R2 uh, because it's just, I mean, it, it's just would be, I mean, there's too many such cases. But for the real line, we actually have a classification theorem that tells us that the connected subsets of R are the intervals. So this includes R itself, right? So. R itself is an interval. So that would mean that the real line is also connected, which is not surprising because it's a, it's a, it's a line. It's a full line, so it should be connected. So we can talk about how one proves such a theorem. Uh, this, is, this theorem is actually a bit tricky to prove. It's not that easy to prove. It seems, it seems it should be simple, but it's not that simple because when you're proving if you want to show that something is disconnected, think about what, you, what you're doing. You're, you have to show an example of a Clopin set, right? You just have to produce an example. But when you're saying that something is connected, you're sort of saying it is impossible to do something. So then it, a proof is required. So let's discuss the idea behind the proof. So let's do this first. 
let us prove that if A is a subset of R is not an interval, then A is not connected, i.e. it is disconnected. So that's what, let's begin by proving this first, because this is actually easier. If you're claiming that something is disconnected, then there's a way to disconnect it. So there's a way to produce a disconnection. There's a way to split it into two pieces and produce the Clopin sets. So then you're claiming that something could be done, and you just have to show how to do it. Showing that something is connected is actually harder. Is not an interval. So here's the way the proof is going to go. Proof. So if A was an interval, then for any two points, P and Q and A, and any X between P and Q, we would have that X is an element of A. So if A is not an interval, there, so you kind of negate this. There exist, right? So you're saying for any points P and Q. So if it's not an inter interval, then there exist two exceptional points P and Q. Then there exists P and Q and some x between p and q so that x is not in a right it's just the opposite of that condition so if it was not an interval so this is the definition of an interval so if it's not an interval this property is being negated so without so for any becomes there exist and for any x there is some x and instead of x in a you have x not in a okay so what do we do next so here's what we do next Maybe I can show you like a picture. So here's like a picture to pick in my, uh, to have in mind. We're saying there exists a point P, there exists a point Q, and there exists some point X between P and Q that is not part of the interval. And then what we'll do is we'll consider this portion, and then we'll consider that portion. Right? We'll consider this side, and then we'll consider that side. And this X does not belong to A. So it does not belong to A. So here's what we do. So let u be negative infinity up to x intersect a and v be the interval from x to infinity intersect a. So that's basically what we have in this picture. You see, we have, we're kind of drawing this, these two intervals in opposite sides. So the interval from, from x out to infinity and from x to negative infinity Okay, we have these two, and then observe that U is open in A, right? This is an open subset of A for the simple reason because this is open, right? This, this interval, this is open in R. It's open in the ambient space. So in the subspace topology, if you take something that's open in R, which is this open interval, and you intersect it with A, then the resulting set is by definition an open subset of A, right? Furthermore, furthermore, since X is not in A, this is very important. This, it seems like it's pointless, but this is very important. That's an important observation. Since X is not in A, the complement, so if you take A and you take the complement, what do you get? You get V, right? You're going to get you're going to get uh, x to infinity intersect a. So, so let me explain that part again. So when you take the complement, taking the complement, you're taking everything that's being left out. So technically, technically, the complement of this, it would be it would be the other side. It would include x. So it's supposed to really go like this. It's supposed to go x to infinity. It's, it's supposed to include x and go out to infinity. But the point is, x is not in a. That's not in A. So there's no reason to use this square bracket. You can use the open bracket. And the point is, this is an open set. You see that? That's an open set. So this is open in R. So, so A 
the complement of this is open in A. Thus, U is clopin. It's a clopin subset. It's a clopin subset of A. It's a clopin subset because look at this. U is open and its complement is also open. So if the complement is open, it means the set is closed. So it remains, so it remains to explain why U is not the trivial clopin set, i.e. U is not empty and U is not A. Because that would be like you always have the two extreme cases as clopin subsets. You have to rule that out. So how do we know that? Well, here's how we know that. Uh, so, so here's why. It has everything to do with this right over here. Uh, X is less, P is less than X, and P is an A. So that would mean that in this piece, this one contains P, and this one contains Q. So we would just say, since uh, P is in U, and and Q is in the complement of U, it means U cannot be empty, and it cannot be everything. Because if U was everything, then the complement would be empty. So thus, A is disconnected. And this is a nice proof. It, it's a very, it's a, it's not that complicated. It's a very simple proof. It's very convincing. There, there's nothing suspicious going on. It very nicely follows the definitions. It very nicely uses all of the previous definitions we've used before. And it really shows you that your space is not connected. So now there is a, this is only one half of the theorem. The other half of the theorem. So we proved that if something is not an interval, then it's, it's disconnected. But then there's the harder version of the proof, which is to show that if something is connected, if it's it, if it is, I'm sorry, if it is an interval, it's the converse. If something is an interval, then it is connected. So that's the much harder version. So the harder, the harder part of the theorem is to show that if, uh, let's say, I is an interval, then I must be connected. So the only clopin sets in I are the empty set and the entire set. That's what we have to show. We have to rule out the possibility of any other clopin set. So this, therefore, is harder to do because in the previous one, we just had to produce a separation. Here we have to show no such separation can exist. And what we'll do is we're going to give a, we're going to give a, um, we're going to give a partial proof uh, with some minor steps missing. Now, the, the missing steps will actually be very minor. Um, what you will see is they're very believable. Like, they're small little facts about topology that require a separate type of argument. And I think what will make sense if I put those minor little steps on the next homework assignment and you get to figure out yourself. They're not, they're not actually that difficult. So I'm going to give you, like, the key idea of the proof. And there are small little verifications you have to do along the way. So this is going to be uh, definitely harder than the, other, than the other version of the proof. So here's the way we're going to do it. Now, instead of proving this for an arbitrary interval, because there's many different kinds of intervals you can have, we're going to prove it in a very specific type of interval. And then from there, you can deduce it for any other type of interval. So that's actually going to be one of the minor missing steps that I'm talking about. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to prove it in the special case. We're going to assume that I is going to be the closed interval from 0 to 1. And if you can prove it for the closed interval from 0 to 1, you'll be able to then prove it for any other type of interval. It could be an open interval. It could be like half open. It could be infinite. 
and things like that. So, uh, so that, that, that's what I mean by minor steps. We're just going to prove it for this one. Because otherwise, the proof's going to get unnecessarily long. And I think it makes more sense just to put it on the homework and you figure out yourself how to finish it. OK, so let's take this down. And this is going to be theorem. Uh, 0, 1. OK, so this is just x in R with the property that x is between 0 and 1 is connected. It's a connected space. So proof. So we're going to uh, assume that C as a, as a subset of 0, 1 is clopin. So we're going to assume we have a we have a clopin subset of 0, 1. We want to show we want to show that whatever that clopin set is, it's either empty or it's the interval from 0, 1. That's what it means to be connected. Connected means that clopin sets are the, only the trivial examples that you can think of. So here's what we do. We're going to take the supremum. And why the supremum? Well, it's a theorem. So because it's a theorem, that means you have to do things that are not immediately clear. You, you know, the previous proof, you just mainly follow the definitions. This one, you have to do something a bit more clever. It's not something that immediately comes to mind. So you're going to let x be the supremum of c, right? It has a supremum. And since c is contained in 0, 1, it means the supremum has to be some number between 0 and 1. So this is a subset of 0, 1. So the supremum, the least upper bound, has to come somewhere from that interval. I guess maybe you want the justification for why the supremum has to be that. But that's what I mean, small minor things. Now, so now C is closed in 0, 1, right? Why is it closed in 0, 1? Because it's clopen. It's open and closed simultaneously in 0, 1. And 0, 1 is closed in R. That's a closed subset of R. So C is a closed subset of R. So whatever this C is, it's a closed subset of R. And hence, the supremum of C, which is x, must contain, must be, in C itself. So this is the part that I'm not, I'm, I'm taking advantage of this part. This is maybe something you've seen something like this in an advanced calculus class. So if you have like an open interval, like this, an open interval, the supremum, which is right here, the least upper bound, the supremum does not actually have to be part of the set. But if you have, a, if you have like a closed interval, then it contains its boundary, right? The supremum is on the boundary. And so if it's, that's the idea. If it's a closed set, then it contains its boundary. And if it contains its boundary, the supremum is on the boundary, and those is, the supremum is therefore part of the set. So it requires a justification, but I think that's believable. That's not a difficult justification. So I'm going to leave that to a homework problem for you to carefully justify that. So let's assume, let us assume further that this x which is, again, the supremum of C, is smaller than 1. Um, it could be equal to 1, right? x is some number from 0 to 1. But for now, let's assume that it's smaller than 1. And then we'll say what happens if it's, if it's equal to 1. So for now, let's assume the supremum is smaller than 1. And, and so x is in C because C is a closed subset of the real line. So now, uh, if n, and this is an integer, if n is a large, a large enough integer, then x is smaller than x plus 1 over n, and that's smaller than 1, right? So, well, it's clear that if you add 1 over n to x, 
you're getting something bigger than x. This part is clear. Why is this smaller than 1? Well, because we are assuming that this x is not equal to 1 itself. So this number x, it's smaller than 1. So x is away from 1. So there's some separation between x and 1. And so if this n is large enough, as it goes to infinity, x plus 1 over x will be somewhere between x and 1. Maybe it's, not, it's, it's certainly not going to be true if n is equal to 1, because x plus 1 will be bigger than 1. But, so that's not going to be true. But if n is 2, 3, and so on, eventually, if this is sufficiently large, this fraction will be small enough so that you're adding only a tiny little bit, so you're not actually reaching the number 1. So, so thus, this would mean that x plus 1 over n would be an element in the complement, in the complement. So you would take 0, 1, and you would take the complement. So why is it in the complement? Because, so here's the reason. X is the supremum. This is the largest number in C. X is the largest number in C. When you do X plus 1 over N, this is larger than the largest number in C. So it is not in C. And also, it's smaller than 1. So it's somewhere in the interval from 0 to 1. Okay, so whatever this is, it has to be in here. So we have this for sufficiently so for large enough n so if the n is large enough now observe that this interval from 0 1 take away c is also a closed set it's also a closed set in 0 1 and so in the real line Uh, so I guess I should have said this before. If C is a closed subset of 0, 1, and 0, 1 is a closed subset of R, it means C is a closed subset of R. This is sort of the same idea. Why is this? It, because C is clopen. It's open and closed. It, so the complement of this, so C is a closed subset, but it's also an open subset. So let me say this again. C is closed in R, but C is also open in 0, 1. So its complement in 0, 1 is, op is closed, right? It's, C is also open. So its complement is also closed, and 0, 1 is, is closed in R. So what, so what does this mean? 0, 1 is a closed subset of 0, 1 that's just being clopen, and this is closed. So, yeah. So it's a closed subset of R. So therefore, so thus, if you consider the limit as n goes to infinity of this sequence, that would have to be an element of whatever this is. Uh, because, I mean, it's the same idea. Uh, this is closed, so it contains its limit. Th that's what it has to do with. Again, this is the, it's very similar to the idea of supremum, that this is a closed set. So whatever this is, this is sort of getting to its boundary, and a closed set contains its boundary. So whatever the limit of this is, it has to be in the set. But what's the limit of this? The limit of this is x. But then, but then x has to be an element of this. And why is this? This, is a, this contradicts that x is an element of c. See that we, we said, you see, we said that x is in c, right? x is in c. And x is in the complement of c. So the reason why x is in c was because x was the supreme. And the reason why x is in the complement of c is because x is the limit of these numbers which are in the complement. And since this is closed, it will contain its limit. So you have a contradiction out of this. Now, what, where did the contradiction come from? The contradiction came from this assumption. Let us assume further that the supremum is less than 1. Let us assume further that the supremum is less than 1. So therefore, to avoid the contradiction, so to avoid, so the last remaining possibility is that C is clopen in 0, 1, and the supremum of C is equal to 1. If the supremum is less than 1, you see, the reason why this is important is because we can add a little bit to x. 
So it's less than one. So the last remaining possibility is the supremum is equal to one. Okay, so, but then, but then the complement is also clopin. Right, then the complement, then the complement is also clopin because C is open and closed. So then if C is open, its complement is closed. If C is closed, its complement is open. So that means the complement is, is also open and closed. And now you repeat the same argument apply to 0, 1, take away C. Because this is, you're back to something being clopen. And the supremum, and the supremum of this thing is therefore going to be less than one, right? Because if C contains one, then its complement does not contain one. And you're back to a clopen set, right? You're back to a clopen set, back to a clopen set whose supremum is less than one, and then you kind of repeat the argument from before. So the only possibility, the only possibility is when, when you reach this, is that, so we want to only show that these are the two possibilities. So why are these the only two possibilities? Well, the supremum cannot be smaller than one. So that rules out the empty set. Well, I mean, well, we're assuming we do not have the empty set to start with because we're picking something in C. So if so if this set, if this clopen set in the beginning, if its supremum is equal to one, we get our contradiction. So the supremum of it has to be equal to one. But then we look at its complement, and its complement, its supremum is less than one. But the other possibility that can happen is that the complement of, of C is actually the empty set. But then that meant that the original clopen set that we've chosen was the entire set. So the only like the, the, the only way you avoid the contradiction is when you're in one of these two cases, right? Because we said, let X be the supremum of C. If C is the empty set, then the supremum is negative infinity, if you, if you heard that, but the, the supremum of the empty set. So we're kind of here specifically assuming C is not empty, right? We're, we're saying if C is not empty and the supremum is not one, we get a contradiction. So now you, you go to its complement. So its complement, so if, the, if this is not empty, which is another way of saying C is not the entire set, then its supremum is less than one, and then you get a contradiction. So the only way to, to sort of avoid the contradiction is either when C is either empty or C is the entire set. And that's kind of the way what we were, we're claiming in the beginning. So you can see this is not an easy proof. It's, it's definitely not a simple proof. It's fairly long, and there's more things to be done. That's what we wanted to mention about intervals. So now we can take a nice advantage of what we've just proven and produce many examples of connected sets and prove it. So let's make this definition. So a set of Rn is called convex if and only if it satisfies the following property for any two for any two points p and q in a we have that the line segment from p to q is contained in a also where the line segment from p to q is equal to by definition this this is the way you write it you write it as p t plus one minus t times q, and then t is the real number, you think of it as time, and it ranges from zero to one. So just to avoid confusion, this is of course a vector, because that's a point in Rn, and this is a scalar, because that's just a real number from zero to one. This is a scalar, and that is a vector. Okay, so notice what happens. If t is equal to zero, this is zero, and this is one minus zero, so that's one q. So then you get Q, you get some point Q. If T is equal to one, then this is one times P. So that's P plus 
one minus one, so that's zero, this goes away. So then you get P, so you get P somewhere. And then you're moving, so as T goes from zero to one, you're moving from Q to P. So you're kind of drawing a line between the two. Right, so it's some line that connects P to Q. You can also write it in the opposite order. It does not really matter. Uh, I know that the way I've written it, you're kind of thinking of the orientation as going from P to Q, but writing it like this makes it seem to go backwards. But it, we're not really concerned about orientation. You just get this kind of segment. So here's the idea of a convex set. The picture is that if a set is convex, so if a set is convex, so for, for instance, um, yeah, that's, that's still not convex. So this would be convex. So the idea of convex is if you pick any two points P and Q and you connect the line, the line stays within the set. Any two point, the line stays within the set, no matter how you do it. So this is what we call convex. If you want an example of something that is not convex, you might have something that looks like this, let's say. So then you have P. So here, if you have P and Q, it stays in the set. But the problem is you might have a point over here and you might have a point over there. And then the line segment that connects them, it leaves the space. So convex has the property that um, if you pick any two points in, in, your, in your set. So this is, of course, this is very special. This only makes sense in Euclidean space. What we're doing right now makes no sense in any other space because you cannot do this in a general space. These have to be vectors. You're multiplying them by scalars. You're adding them together. Th this notion will make no sense in, in a more general space. But in Euclidean space, this makes sense. You can talk about the line segment between P and Q, and you want to say that this line segment, it's contained within your space. That's called convex. And there's actually an entire form of analysis. Maybe you've heard about this. This is very important in applied mathematics. It's called convex analysis. It's the analysis of convex sets and convex functions. There are these things called convex functions. This, it's usually studied uh, by people who are doing applied mathematics. They're more interested in like optimization type of problems because in convex analysis, you're often talking about these questions about uh, various algorithms and methods and theorems about whether or not there is a minimum solution to a convex problem. Okay, so this is the definition of a convex set. And the theorem here is very nice. It's a very nice theorem. Uh, it's actually very easy to prove, fortunately. Proposition. So if A is a subset of Rn is convex, then A is connected. So convex sets, convex subsets of Rn are automatically connected. So as a corollary, this is an immediate corollary, Rn is connected. So Euclidean space is connected. And some of you might have wondered, so we talked about sets being open and closed at the same time, and some of you might have wondered, other than the, like, because usually when we think of topology, we think about Euclidean space. And when we think about Euclidean space, we normally think about the plane, because that's like the most convenient one to visualize. So maybe some of you have wondered, well, can you find a, uh, a subset in the plane which has open and closed at the same time, but it's not one of those silly examples with the empty set of, or the entire set? And you probably tried to find examples and you were unable to do it. So you wondered whether there's some kind of bizarre example. And this kind of answers your question. There is no such example because Rn is connected. So that's what it has to do with. So let's go ahead and prove this proposition. The proof is fortunately uh, very nice. It's not that long. And the reason why it's nice is because we actually did the hard work. The hard work was proving that the interval from 0 to 1 was connected. Because if you look at this, that's kind of like the interval from 0 to 1. Okay, so we're going to take advantage of that, right? So this is sort of like the interval from 0 to 1. Uh, I, I know it looks a bit different because these are like two points in Rn, but there's a homeomorphism, right? Homeomorphically, we talked about homeomorphisms last time. There's a homeomorphism that maps this to this. It requires a simple proof, but it's not that difficult. A homeomorphism between these two sets. And so it means if this is connected, the interval from 0 to 1, it will mean that that is connected. So here's how the proof goes. So to show that A is connected, 
we pick a clopin set C in A, so a clopin subset of A, and argue that C has to be empty or C has to be A, and there's, and there's nothing else. That's the definition of being connected. So here's the way we're going to do this. So assume C is not empty and C is not A. And we're going to derive a contradiction. So we can pick a point in C. Why can we pick a point in C? Well, because C is not empty. And a point, let's call it Q, which is not in C. Why can we do that? Well, because uh, maybe, maybe I should be, I'm going to add a little bit of detail. So pick two points. So let me write it like this. So pick two points, P and Q and A, with P in C, but Q is not in C. Right? C is not empty, so there's something there, and C is not everything, so it's missing some point. So you call it whatever point it's missing, you call that you call that point Q. And now you let L be the line segment from P to Q. So you let L be the line segment from P to Q. And by assumption, we we're assuming. And actually, let me say it like this. Since A is convex, this line segment is contained in A, right? This is exactly where we're using the fact that A is convex. The fact that L is contained in A will be crucial in this proof, right? We're assuming that the set is convex, and so by definition, it contains a line segment. OK, so therefore, If we do L intersect C, this is a this is a closed this is a clopen subset of L. This is a clopen subset of L. How do we see that? Um, maybe to make it easier, let's say it's an open subset. An open subset of L. So open in L. How does that look like? This is, so L sits inside A, right? L sits inside A. So open in L is open in A. Right, so L is a subset of A. So with the subspace topology, so we're secretly using something here, which is very subtle. And we're using the fact that if you have three spaces where each one sits in the follow, so you basically have this situation. You have L sitting inside A and A is sitting inside Rn. So the subspace topology on A, so you have the subspace topology on A as a subset of Rn. And then you have the subspace topology on L as a subspace as a subspace of A. But you can also talk about the subspace topology of L as a subspace of Rn. But the, that, that was the homework problem, that when you have this kind of situation, the subspace topology is always going to be the same. There's no ambiguity which one you're talking about. So that's fortunate for us. So here's what it, an open, and something is open in L. If you can find, so think of L as being contained in A. This is important, right? We're assuming that L sits inside A. Something open in A, and then you intersect it with L. Right? So this is exactly what the C, the C is open in A. Because why is C open in A? Because C was clopen at the beginning. So it's an open set in A. So L intersect C. So open in C is C. It's exactly this. And then you can do the exact same thing with closed sets. So something would be closed in L if it's 
if it's closed in A, intersect with L. But C is also closed in A. So therefore, L intersects C, it's open and closed. So you would just say this is a clopen subset, clopen subset of L. Okay? So that's that's what it has to do with. But L is homeomorphic. So that means there's a homeomorphism. There's a continuous bijection with a continuous inverse. That's what we mean by homeomorphism. But L is homeomorphic to the interval from 0 to 1. And 0 to 1 is connected because we just proved that. So L is connected. Now, I guess this takes a minor proof, which I do not want to write here. I think that would make a good homework problem. So there's two things you need to show. You need to show that L is homeomorphic to 0, 1. That's not particularly difficult. You have to create that continuous bijection with a continuous inverse. That's not particularly difficult to do. And then the second thing you have to show is you have to show that connectedness is a topological invariant, which means that if two spaces are homeomorphic and one space is connected, then the other space is connected. That's actually also very easy to show. So assuming that fact, L, L is, L is connected. So L is connected. Okay. So what does this mean? So the only Clopin subsets of L are the empty set and the entire set. So thus, L intersect C, which is Clopin, right? We said this is Clopin. L intersect C is Clopin. Therefore, L intersect C is equal to the empty set or equal to L. But we have a problem. But P is in C, and P is in L, because L was the interval, was the line segment, I should say, from, from P to Q. So L intersect C is not empty. Also, uh, Q is not in C. Right, we picked a point Q not in C. Also, Q is not in C. So, Q is not in L intersect C. Because Q is in C, but it's not in L. And so, L intersect C cannot be L. So this Clopin set cannot be empty and it cannot be L. This is a contradiction. This contradicts that L is connected. Where did the contradiction come from? The contradiction actually came from in the very beginning. Right? We said, assume you have a Clopin set, which is not of these two, and then you can find the two points that satisfy that property. And then from that point on, we were led to a contradiction. So this is a, it's actually a nice proof. It's not that difficult. It nicely uses the properties and all of that. It, it's more straightforward than when we proved that the interval from 0 1 was connected. And now let's move on and talk about uh, mappings, uh, mappings of connected spaces. So let's talk about that. So here is a very important proposition. So let x and Y be spaces, topological spaces, and F is a continuous map. So it's a continuous map or a continuous function, whatever vocabulary you prefer to use. So the proposition will say this. You can actually, if you want to, you can even call this a theorem if you want to, even though the proof of this, its proof is very, very simple, but it's a very deep result. So um, sometimes theorems refer to deep results, which have important consequences, even though they might be straightforward to prove. But let X and Y be spaces and F be a continuous mapping between spaces. So if X is connected, so if X is a connected space, then F of X is a connected subspace, subspace or subset of Y. So this is the, the push forward. So where F of X, this is the push forward 
of x. You also call this the image of x. And this is by definition, this is just f applied to every point in your set. So it's f of x where x is in set x. That's what we call the push forward. So that's a connected subset of y. Right, so when you want to, you can say it like this. You can, you can say it that uh, the, the push forward of a connected space is connected. That's what we're saying. Push forward of a connected space is connected. It's a little bit different from continuity. Uh, continuity says the pullback of an open set is open. This, this one goes with push forwards. So there's two warnings I want to give you here. So this is, let's call this warning one. Warning one. The pullback of a connected space does not need to be connected. And this is warning two. We are saying that f of x, the image of x, is connected. Not necessarily y itself. Because y contains the image, but y is not necessarily the image. So before we prove this, I want to actually just show you these two warnings just so you get to see what happens. And I'm going to give you a, a little bit of intuition about why this proposition works. And then we'll prove it formally, and then we'll see some nice consequences of the proof. But let's talk about warning one. The pullback, the pullback of a connected space does not need to be connected. So uh, I'll, I'll do it down here, and, and then I'll remove it. So this is warning one. So here's an example. I'm going to draw a picture that will illustrate this. The pullback of a connected space does not need to be connected. So imagine this. Imagine x represents this line segment and that line segment. Okay, so this is intuitively disconnected. And this is y. And the mapping, here's what the mapping does. It takes this line segment and it bends it. Well, maybe even simpler. It just maps it like this. Right? You take this line segment and you tilt it and you make it go like this, and you take that line segment, and you tilt it, and you make it go like that, and then you connect them at the endpoints. So basically, the way this map works is that these two are being glued together. So that's what this function is doing. This function is taking these two points and sort of glues them together, and they come together, and now you have this. So look at this. That, so this one is connected. So x is disconnected, and y is connected. So you have a continuous map from x to y. So what's the pullback? So this is the, if you pull this back, you get these two intervals that are no longer attached together. So the pullback of a connected space does not need to be connected. It could be, but it's not guaranteed. Okay. So when you're talking about connected spaces and continuous maps, it's always about the forward image. It's always about the push forward. It's not about the pullback. Pullbacks are for, for continuity and open sets. Okay. So this is sort of addresses warning one. Let's say something about um, warning two. So we're saying that the image of X is connected, not necessarily Y itself. So here is a picture for how this goes. So let's say this is X, right? And this is going to be Y, this entire square. So this can be R2. This is going to be Y. And the mapping that sends X into R2 just takes this line segment and it bends it somehow. Okay, so this is Y. But the image of X is this kind of path or something. So X is being, oh, okay, so this is not, yeah, uh, let, me, um, let me do this again. Not, not the best. So let's say Y consists of these two disconnected squares, okay? So this is the way Y looks like. It's two disconnected squares. But the way this, what this function is doing, it's taking X and kind of sends it only into that square. So that piece, that's the forward image. So X gets continuously deformed into something like this, but Y itself is two disconnected squares. So notice what the warning is saying. We are saying that F of X, it's the image of X. This is the image, this is connected. That F of X is the image of X is connected, not necessarily Y itself. Y itself does not need to be connected because you can have a picture like this. 
Okay, so let's remove warning two. And the intuition here is actually quite nice. The reason why this works, you can kind of see it in this picture. The reason why this works is because what is a continuous map? A continuous map is you're somehow twisting this and deforming it in the way without ripping the space apart. You're not allowed to destroy the space. So you can imagine that you're taking this segment and you can do whatever you want with it. You can kind of make it go into like loops or whatever. You can turn your space into something like this. You can kind of twist it in many different ways. But the point is you're not allowed to destroy it, right? Continuous maps do not destroy your space. So you cannot have a situation that the image will somehow end up in two different pieces because continuous maps do not destroy the space. So if you started with a space that was originally connected and you apply some continuous transformation to it, intuitively it makes sense that it should remain connected from beginning to end. So that's like the uh, intuition behind this proposition. So let's give a proof here. Proof. Uh, the proof is actually very short. And this is kind of illustrates to you that you're on the right track. Uh, whenever you're coming up with a math theory about something, the proofs should be nice and short and elegant, directly to the point, no hand waving, no pictures. That somehow illustrates to you that you really captured the main idea of what you're trying to say. So this theory of topology that we're doing and connected sets and all of that, it really seems to capture this idea very nicely. So here is the way the proof goes. So without loss of generality, we can assume that the forward image of X is actually Y itself. Because otherwise, if let's say the forward image of X is equal to Z, then Z is a subset of Y. And we can consider, we can consider F as a continuous mapping from X to Z, where the image of X is Z itself, right? You just replace Y by the image. So this was on your last homework problem that there, if you re, uh, recall, there was this homework problem about, and we also mentioned this in class, about extending and contracting the codomain of a continuous function. So what we're saying is if F of X, if the image is actually a smaller subset, it's not actually equal to Y itself, if it's something smaller, then whatever it is, let's call it Z, and Z is a subset of Y. And then you can consider F as a mapping from X to Z. It will still be a continuous mapping because Z is a subset of Y and you have, it has the subspace to poly. So this is still a continuous mapping. And then you just reapply the, all, the entire argument again with the assumption that Z is the image of F. So you can assume from the very beginning that Y is actually the image. Uh, so F of X is actually equal to Y. So without loss of generality, we can assume that F of X is equal to Y. So I'm gonna actually remove this. Okay, so. So in other words, F is a surjection from X onto Y, right? It's a surjection. Every point of Y is being reached. So we want to prove that Y is connected because f of x is y. We want to prove that f of x is connected, but we're assuming that f of x is equal to y. So we want to prove that, that f of x, which, which in this case is y, is connected. So we want to prove that y is connected. So how do we do this? Here's how we do it. So we're going to uh, suppose c is a clopin subset of y, and we need to show that C is either empty or C is equal to Y. That's the definition of being connected. So to accomplish this, well, we use continuity. So behold that F inverse of C is a clopin subset of X.
Why? Why is that? Well, what does clopen mean? Clopen means open and closed. And F is a continuous mapping. So what's the definition of a continuous mapping? The pullback of an open set is open, and also the pullback of a closed set is closed. So C is open, so its pullback is open. C is closed, its pullback is closed. So F inverse of C, the pullback is open and closed. Okay, so now we, we take advantage, but X is connected. So F inverse, which is your clopen set, the only thing it can be, it can either be empty or it can be all of X. Okay, so thus, and now apply F again. So thus F, F inverse of C is equal to F of the empty set or F, F inverse of C is equal to F of X, right? So all we're doing is, if you're confused, all what we're doing is, so if this is equal to the empty set, you just apply F to both sides, okay? And the other case is, if this is equal to X, you just apply F to both sides again. So that's all we're doing, just applying F to both sides. So now this, is empty, right? The forward image of the empty set is empty. There's nothing there to map, so it's just empty. And this is Y, right? And this is Y, okay? Uh, because F of X, we said, was, was Y. Okay, now here's the part which is actually important. So in general, F, F inverse of C contains, see, actually, I'm not sure. Maybe it goes the other way around. Maybe it contain. Maybe it's contained. I'm not sure. The reason why I'm not sure is because I'm lazy to think and figure it out. It, it's one of these two. Um, so I always forget. I always have to rederive it. Okay. So there's like two of them. One of them goes like f inverse f of c, and it contains c, or maybe it's contained. I'm not sure. Like it's one of those set operations that is impossible to memorize. So it's either this one or this one, and it's not difficult to figure it out. But we're mathematicians. We're lazy. We do not want to think about that. So it's one of these two. I'm not sure which one. I think it's, I'm just going to guess it's this one. If it's not this one, it's the other one. So in general, but because, but this is the important part, because F is surjective. It's surjective between X and Y. It means that if you do F, F inverse of C, you actually get the thing that you want. That it's almost as if these two Fs cancel each other away and you get that it's equal to C. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna skip this, skip this, oof. I'm gonna skip it. Uh, you can do it, this is just pure set theory. This is just the most elementary type of set theory. It's not very exciting. Uh, the reason why it has to work is because otherwise we're not able to prove what we wanna prove, right? It's just as simple as that. The, the reason why this theorem works is precisely because the function is surjective because at the very beginning, we made this assumption that we have a surjective from X onto Y. And so what does this mean? This means that this is C and this is C. So look at what we've shown. We've shown that this is C. So C is either empty or C is equal to Y. And is that what we wanted to show? Yes, that's exactly what we wanted to show. This is, we wanted to show that C is empty or C is equal. That's exactly what we wanted to show in the very beginning. So this proves to us that this forward image, right, this forward image is a connected subset of Y. So, and, and there we go, that, that, that completes the proof. So. It's a very nice proof. It's it's fairly simple. There's not nothing much clever going on here, and it just so nicely illustrates that you're on the right track with the right ideas and the right definitions to really capture the, the topology of what's going on. So, let me show you a very interesting corollary of everything that we've done. So here is the intermediate intermediate value theorem from calculus, and this is going to be amazing. If you've ever taken a advanced calculus class, and I assume you have, but if you've not, that's fine, but uh, you probably have taken an advanced calculus class, and in the advanced calculus class, you learn about the intermediate value theorem, and if you recall, that takes quite some work to prove. Uh, you might spend like an entire lecture just carefully going over the proof of the intermediate value theorem, and what you're about to see is you're going to see a proof of the intermediate value theorem that is shorter than actually writing the statement of the intermediate value theorem, and the reason why you can do this is precisely because you're able to take advantage of the topology. 
So this is a topological proof of the intermediate value theorem. And, and it kind of reinforces what we said earlier in this course, that a lot of math consists in relearning the same thing over and over and over and over again. But each time you relearn it, you relearn it on a deeper level. So what this shows is that the intermediate value theorem is really a special case of connected spaces. It's a special, it's a special case of this theorem that connected spaces get mapped. The image of those spaces become connected spaces. So it's really like a special case of that. So uh, let's actually write down what the intermediate value theorem says. So I want to just quickly draw a picture of what the intermediate value theorem is. The intermediate value theorem basically says this. If you have some kind of interval from A to B, and you have a function on this interval, and it goes something like this. So the intermediate value theorem would say that this, so this right over here is f of A. This over here, this right over here is f of B. And the intermediate value theorem says that if you draw a line, if you pick a number between these two, um, how should we call that number? Let's call it y. If you pick some y between these two, then there's a point somewhere. It could be more than one, right? There's a point somewhere, like x. There's a point somewhere between A and B that gets mapped to that line. So sometimes they tell you the intermediate value theorem says that you can draw a curve, a continuous curve, without lifting up your pen or, or, or something like that. So that's what we call the intermediate value theorem. So here's the actual statement of it. It says that suppose you have a function uh, that's defined on the closed interval, so that's the domain of the function, and it maps it into the real line is a continuous function. And y is something between f of a and f of b. So we're going to assume that f of a is smaller than f of b, but it also works the other way around. You, you can also show that f of b is bigger than f. I mean, the argument goes the other way around. In this picture, we drew, we drew this one as being smaller, and we drew that one being bigger. But it works the other way around as well. So y is in between them. So this is called, this is called IE. So y is an intermediate value. It's an intermediate value. So it's, it's in between these two. So it's intermediate. That's why it's called intermediate value theorem. So y is in between these two. And then the statement says, then there exists at least one, there could be more, but at least one, there exists an x between a and b so that f of x is exactly equal to y. So that's the intermediate value theorem. It's, it's, uh, it's a nice theorem. It, you can use it to prove that like square roots exist and nth roots ex exist and things like that. And uh, proving this in an advanced calculus class, it certainly takes a lot of efforts. There's a lot of different proofs. There's a proof that uses supremums. The proof that I like when I teach advanced calculus, the proof that I like to do is I like to use something called the nested interval theorem. I think that's a very nice proof. But regardless of what you use, it is a involved proof. It definitely takes work to be done. And we're going to produce a super simple, easy proof of this. So here's the way it goes. Uh, this is very nice to see how many of the things you learned in math, they're special cases of something more general. So here's the proof. Proof. Here's the way the proof goes. Uh, so let uh, so let I be this interval from A to B. This is a connected space. So the reason why this is a connected space is because that goes back to that complicated theorem we mentioned earlier that intervals are connected spaces. So that's a connected space. We technically only proved it for the interval from 0 to 1, but it will be a homework problem where you prove it for any interval in general. So this is a connected space. OK, so that's a connected space. And then, therefore, and now let, so thus, the image of this, right? So the image of 0 of AB, which is f of i, is a connected subset of R. This is the theorem. Why, why is this? Well, because the image of a connected space is connected. Right, that's the theorem. The image of a connected space is connected. This is connected. That's the image, the forward image 
of this space. So then whatever this is, this is a subset, a subspace of R, and as a subset of, and as a subspace of R, it's connected. So this is a connected subset of R. So it must be an interval, right? Remember what we said, the connected subsets of R are intervals. So hence, f of i must be an interval, must be an interval. Now behold, f of a and f of b are elements of f of i. Right, this should make sense, right? Because this interval contains a, so f of a is an element of f of i, and the interval contains b, the right endpoint. So f of b is an element of f of i, right? So it, it's just it just has to do with the fact that this interval is, contains an endpoint. So these belong to, to that interval. So f of a and f of b belong to f of i. This is an interval, right? This is this is some interval. They belong to an interval. And y is some number between f of a and f of b. So y has to belong to f of i also. This is the interval property, right? This is the, this is the interval property, right? That's the interval. The interval property says that if, so what's the interval property? That if two numbers, if you pick a number, if you have an interval, if two numbers are part of an interval, then any number between them is part of the interval. So whatever this y is, it's in the interval. Now this y is something that was chosen over here, it was chosen a number between those two. Okay, so y belongs to the interval. So thus, y is equal to what? Now, this is the this is the image. You have to just recall what this image is. The image set, this is of the form, let's call it f of, I do not want to call it x, let's call it f of p, where p is a number between a and b. Right, this is this is the image set. That, that's the definition of the image. So if y belongs to that, then it means y has to be f of something. So y is equal to f of x for some x between a and b. And that completes the proof. So look how short this proof is. I made the proof as long as I could just to give you every possible detail so there's no confusion. And even me trying to make this proof as long as possible, it's still very short. And it just nicely follows from our understanding of topology and connected sets and all of that in continuous maps. In advanced calculus, you do not have any of this machinery. So you sort of have to prove it from first principles and then it's difficult to do. So now I want to mention something else. I want to mention this thing called path connected spaces. And I'm going to put this on the homework and you'll try to think it through. Definition. So uh, let's go back to what it means to be convex. So this is convex. If you have two points P and you have Q, then the line segment between them is in the set. So it's going to be convex. So we said that convex sets are connected, right? So we said, we said that convex subsets of Rn are connected. But you want to be careful. There's lots of connected subsets, subsets, which are not convex, which are not convex. So for example, you can have something that looks like this, like this hourglass shape. That's not convex, right? That's not part of the set, but it's still connected. Or maybe, maybe you even have like a hole in the middle, like an annulus this annulus, if you pick a point here and you pick a point there, it's not convex. So things sort of, uh, so it's not, it's not, but it's still connected. So you might think, well, you do not, the line segment is not necessarily part of the space, but topologically speaking, it does not have to be a straight line. It could be like a curved line. The curved line is still part of the space, where here you can take this arc going around and that's still part of the space. So you would think that maybe there's some kind of topological way of saying, that you can join two points together, not necessarily by a straight line, and then the space should still be connected. And that is correct. So let's formulate what that is. So I, the reason why I uh, mentioned convex sets is because I mainly wanted you to see them. They're very important sets. And that was like a good opportunity to introduce them. But what we're about to say here is more general. This is like a much more general fact about spaces that are not even necessarily convex. 
but convex sets are important in and of themselves that you should definitely see what they are. So here is the definition. X is a path connected space, is a path connected space if and only if for any for any two points P and Q and X. So if you pick any two points in X, we can find a continuous map that takes us from the interval from 0 to 1. It maps us into our space X with F of 0 being P and F of 1 being Q. So this is called a path connected space. It's similar to a convex set. But the problem with convex sets, no, convex sets only make sense in Euclidean space. Because spaces in general, uh, well, because convexity, if you look at the definition of convexity, you're doing like P plus Q, there's a T over here, there's a 1 minus T. These operations do not make sense in general. In a, in a general abstract space, you cannot add points together, or you cannot multiply a point by a scalar. There's something very special about Euclidean space. So convexity is something that only makes sense in Euclidean space. More generally, you can also do it in something called a Banach space, which is a generalization of Euclidean space, but I do not want to go there. So, so convexity is just something that's very special. But in topology, it, it's not really applicable to topology in general. So let's talk about this thing called path-connected space, which is a little bit more suitable for topology. So the idea of a path-connected space is this, that you have, so you would say that a space X is path-connected if it has the following property. If you pick a point P and you pick a point Q, you can take the interval from 0 to 1, right? This is your interval from 0 to 1. And you can map the interval from 0 to 1. So you kind of think of this as time. You think of this interval as representing the time axis. When time is equal to 0, you start at P. And when time is equal to 1, when you flow one unit into the future, you flow continuously to another point to another point Q. So the picture here, here is that you have some kind of mapping, F, that will take this interval and it will map it continuously to something like this. It will give you, it does not have to actually even look like that. It might even like maybe twist or something. It does not matter. The point is, it will map it, it will map this interval into something that goes like that. And when that happens, you have, as you can see, from 0 1, as you can see, you have this, right? So you have a, a connection between P and Q, and that's what you call a path connected space, right? So here's the proposition that we're going to prove. And I'm going to put this on the homework because the proof is remarkably similar to what we did with convexity. It will be almost the same proof. It's a very, very nice proof. So here is the proposition. And it says that if X is a path connected space, then X is a connected space. Okay, so here we have two different terms, path connected and connected. Connected has something to do with open and closed sets. Connected means the only open and closed sets are the trivial sets. Path connected means that there's this continuous mapping into your space that satisfies this. So there are two very different definitions, and the path connected definition implies the connectedness definition. And I'm going to give you a proof outline. It's, it's, we, we almost proved it. So this is the proof outline, and then you can do it yourself nice practice to do it yourself. So here's how you do it. So let L be the, um, the image of this interval. Okay. So in, in the picture, this is L. Now you probably recall L was the line segment in the convexity proof. But here, L, instead of being a straight line segment, is this line path. It's this line, it's this path segment. So let L be equal to this. And since L is the image of a continuous map, it means L is connected. So now 
uh, copy and paste the convexity, the convexity proof all over again. It's the same proof. It's the same proof because in the convexity proof, really the only thing that mattered was that the line segment was connected. And, it, and here L is connected and the same proof goes through. So therefore you are encouraged to prove this yourself. It's actually not difficult. Like the main idea, like the, the, the main thing that makes this work is it has to do with the fact that zero one is connected, which we've proved. It has to do with the fact that zero one is connected. And it has to do with the fact that the image of this is going to be connected. So when you put both of those together, you're able to therefore complete this proof. And I want to finish with something that are called connected components. So this is the last thing we'll talk about connectedness. So let's finish with this. Connected components. So here is the, the idea. Now, before we write down the definition, I want to draw some pictures. So if you look at this space over here, this is X. There's like three different pieces of this. So you refer to these three pieces as the connected components. Connected components of X. So if, if a space is actually connected, it only has one component, the space itself, right? The whole thing stays in one, one, one piece. But in general, spaces can be broken into many components. A finite number, it could be an infinite number of components, but th this is uh, what, what you have. So they're called the connected components of X. So let's introduce this definition. Definition. Oh, I want to just maybe give a, a, a quick comment before I write down this definition. So this is like a question you can ask. Does connected imply path connected? And the answer is no. And maybe I'll give you an example somewhere on the homework. But the simple answer, the, 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 the simple reason why you should not expect this, like even before you give an example, what should make you feel like there's, there, there's not supposed to be that relationship, it has to do with this path connectedness. This involves the real numbers because you're using the interval from zero to one, and then you're mapping that interval into a space. So path connectedness fundamentally uses the real numbers. Whereas connectedness, this is something that is, that is very general. As, as the examples that we've seen before, you, we have examples of spaces that have nothing to do with the real numbers. You can have spaces that completely in general, in the, uh, not in any way related to the real numbers, like the finite complement topology or something like that. So, uh, Path connectedness is specifically something that involves the real numbers, and connectedness is something in general for all spaces. So there's no reason for you to think why a connected space can be can be described in this way with the real numbers. Okay, so uh, the real numbers is something special, and this is something more general. So then it's appropriate to say, does this special property imply a more general property as opposed to some general property implying some kind of very specialized property? So I just thought I should make a comment on that. Okay, so. This is the, uh, the, the, yeah, so that's the question. And now I want to get to connect, connected components. So here is the definition. So the definition here will go as follows. So let X be a space, a topological space. So we're being very sloppy here. Usually before we kind of written it like this, uh, and then we wrote the word topological space. Now we're being super sloppy. X be a space. So a component or a connected component, so a component C of X, or some people say a connected component, but you can probably guess connected component. As you can guess, mathematicians get lazy and we just say a component. So a component of X is a subset. So C is a subset of X with the following properties. Oh, it's just it's just one property. So it's a subset of X. So with the property that it is a maximal a maximal connected subset. So more precisely, if you're confused by what that means, uh, there is a difference between maximum and maximal, if you've never seen this before. Maximum versus 
maximal. So maximum means it contains everything. So for example, the closure. The closure is the maximum closed set. The maximum closed set. So you look at all of the, oh, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. Not, not the, the, the closure is the minimum closed set. I meant to say the interior of a set. The interior of a set is the largest or the maximum, it's the maximum open set inside your, your set. So it's, it contains every other open set. So maximum means it contains everything. Maximal rather means not contained in anything else in something larger. And if something is maximum, then it's maximal. But something could be maximal, but not maximum. You pr maybe you've seen that kind of terminology before in uh, other, other classes. But if you're confused by what that means, I'll make it more, uh, more precise over here. So more precisely, C is a subset of X is connected. Okay, so it's, it's a connected subset. We know what that means. And if C prime, and if C is contained in C prime, and C prime is connected, then C prime has to be C. In other words, there's nothing larger, there's nothing larger that contains C, right? The only connected subset that contains C is just, the, the, the only connected subset yeah, the, the only connected set that contains C is C itself, right? There's nothing larger that can contain C. That's why I mean by maximal. Maximal, it's not contained in anything else. So, so going back to the picture, this sort of uh, illustrates why we call it maximal and not maximum. So if you have, let's say, these two components right here, so this, this entire thing, this is a connected component. It's a connected component. Notice this is also a connected component, but this one does not contain that one. Rather, this one is not contained in anything else. Now imagine that you did you had this picture. Let's say that this was C. Let's say this was C. Well, this piece, this red piece, that is not a connected component because you can put it into something bigger. You can, for example, you can enclose it off in this blue piece. You can find the C prime that will enclose it in something larger and it's still connected. So the connected component is as big as you can go. So as big as you can go is all of this. That's the connected component. You cannot go any bigger. That is the connected component. That is as big as it goes. And therefore, that's why we say it's maximum. You, maximal. You cannot go any bigger and it's connected. Okay. So that, that's the idea behind it. So that's what we call a connected component. So you can have an infinite number of connected components. So for example, so let me give you an interesting example. Uh, let Q have the subspace topology. So here's a picture. Here's the real line. And Q is a subset of the real line. So it's just a bunch of scattered points that get close to each other as much as you want. But they're just a bunch of scattered points. So this is Q. So the connected, so if C is a connected, is a connected subset. So before we say a connected component, let's just pick a connected subset. Is a connected subset of Q, then C must be an interval, right? Uh, the connected subsets of the real line must be intervals. But an interval that contains, but an interval that contains at least two points an interval that contains at least two points has both rational and irrational numbers in it. Right, if, if there's at least two points, so, right, if, if, the, if the interval has any kind of thickness to it, if there's any kind of thickness to it, then within that interval you can find, op you can find rational numbers and irrational numbers. But we only have Q. So since we are working exclusively in Q, the only uh, intervals which are contained in Q 
in Q are singleton sets. Singleton sets. Or you can call them points. But technically, it's not a point. It's a set containing a point. So the connected subsets of Q, and these are actually the connected components, because you cannot go any bigger. So the connected components of Q have the form have the form that it's a set just containing a single number, where Q is just any rational point. So the connected components are just singleton sets. So you can, you can have a situation like that. That's like an extreme situation. That's as small as it gets. A single point is as small as it gets. A one-point a one space is always connected. So, uh, so, so you can have an infinite number of connected components, right? So each of these individually is your connected. So there's an infinite number of them. You can have two components, three components. You will have one component if the space is already connected. So now let's uh, finish up with the following theorem. So here's the following proposition. Let's finish up with this proposition, and then we'll be done. Let x be a space. And let's say ci, this is the set of connected components. Now, you will notice that I'm indexing this by some set. This could be um, infinite collection. It could be a finite collection. It can even be an uncountable collection. The way you can get an uncountable collection of components is if you just go back to the example that we, that we did with the rational numbers, you can redo the same example with the irrational numbers, and then the components will be all the irrational points, and that's an uncountable set. So these are the components. So let x be a space, and ci are the components, and ci are, are the set. Maybe I should say is the family. Maybe I should say is the is the family of all connected components of X. So each of these are subsets of X. They are connected and they're maximal. They're not contained in anything larger. The following properties are satisfied. Are satisfied. So the first property is, uh, let's maybe start with the easiest one. So if you take the union of all of these CI, that's equal to X. So the union of all of the connected components have to give you X. So that kind of makes sense from pictures, but we'll maybe give an explanation to it afterwards uh, more carefully. So the second property is if you take CI and you take CJ, so if you take two different connected components, then they have to be empty. They have no, no overlap. If I and J, if I and J are two different indices. So if you take two different connected components in your collection, then they have no overlap. And the third property says that C, I are closed subsets. They're closed subsets of they're closed subsets of X. They're closed subsets of X. Not necessarily open. They do not have to be open subsets of X. Um, you might find this confusing. I know what you're thinking. I know what all of you are thinking. You're saying, but wait, X is disconnected. And if X is disconnected, it has cl clopen set, right? That's what it means to be disconnected. Well, we're not, we're, so here's the confusion. We're not saying that these are the clopen sets, right? We're not saying those are the, we're just saying those are the connected components, okay? So maybe the confusion comes from the fact that before we were cl uh, calling the clopen sets with the letter C. So you might be psychologically relating them to the clopen sets. I'm not saying that these are the clopen sets, right? If X is disconnected, it has a clopen set. I'm not saying those are the clopen sets. So, so they're the close ups of the, they're not necessarily open. Uh, Actually, actually, the example, if, if you do not believe me, just look at the example that we just did. In the example that we did with Q, right, we did the example with Q. The connected components were the singleton set. So the set of connected components was this. So this is, so the connected components, it went like this. So this was the set of connected components, and the connected components were singleton sets. Okay, so that's the way it looks. So look at this. It's the set of connected components. So it's a set of sets, right? The connected components are singleton sets. 
the singleton sets, they're closed sets because they're just single points. They're, they're close, these are closed subsets of Q. They're not open subsets of Q. They're not open subsets. Uh, they're, they're only closed. So I, I leave that to you to think about, like why this is not an open subset of Q. But every one of these individually, the Q by itself, that's a, that is a um, closed subset of Q. It's not an open subset of Q. So it does not have to be an open subset. But you can see that they're not overlapping, right? This is what we're saying over here. They have no overlap. And the union of all of them give you x. So let's discuss why this is true. So let's so instead of giving you a proof carefully written out, because this lecture just this is like a theme with all of these, they're becoming unnecessarily too long. I'm, I was hoping that each of these lectures is like 90 minutes and they're getting closer to two hours. Sometimes they go longer than two hours, but it's like a theme with all of these lectures. So uh, here's like a quick explanation. So why is this true? This one is, is true because every point, every point in X is contained in some connected subset, subset. Namely, every point is contained in the singleton set. And the singleton set is always connected no matter what space it is, because the single point space will always be a discrete one point space. And that's easy to show why that's connected, because in the discrete one point space, the only subsets are the trivial subset. So it's automatically going to be connected. So every point is always contained in some connected subset. It could happen that this connected subset is the maximal one, or it, there might be something bigger than it. If there's something bigger, then it's in a larger one. But every point in X is always contained in some connected subset. So every point in X will be somewhere in some connected component. So that's the explanation for part one. Now, where does part two come from? So part two is actually a very nice result. And I think I'm going to put this on the homework. So intuitively, this makes sense. But I think I should put this as a homework problem. So this is going to be like an exercise on the homework. So if, so suppose, suppose, let's say A and B are connected subsets of x and a and b intersect so there's they, they have something in common then a union b is also connected now here's why this makes sense intuitively we are saying that if a is a connected space a connected subset of x and b is another connected subset of x when you take their union they do they might not be connected anymore you can see they're separated but we're saying they intersect they have something in common so if they intersect and they have something in common this is b and if they have something in common you're sort of gluing them together and because they're already connected when you glue the, when you glue them together when you put them together the union should therefore stay connected right so this is actually not difficult to prove it's a great exercise it's just a few lines so okay so if they had something in common OK, so this is sort of the, the exercise you want to show. And if they had something in common, so here's what it has to do with. So if, so if CI intersect G, CJ was not empty, then CI union CJ would be connected and contain and strictly contain CI and CJ, but CI and CJ are maximal. They're the maximal components. They cannot be contained in anything larger. That would be the problem. If, it, if they overlapped, then by taking the union, you just created a larger component that contains both of them. So that's why they cannot overlap. And finally, let's make a comment about three. This one, I think I, maybe I can put like an exercise here. Uh, assuming the list of exercises does not get too long, and this is not too difficult to show, then the exercise here would be um, if A is a connected subset of X, then the closure is a connected subset of X. Intuitively, sh this should make sense, right? If you have like a connected subset that maybe goes like this or something, wh what happens when you do the closure? You're just adding in the border. That's it. The border is infinitely close to your set. No separation is being created when you put in the border. So intuitively, adding in the border with the, with the closure, 
closing off the set with, with, with its boundary should not change the connectedness of the set because it's infinitely close. The boundary is infinitely close to the set. There's no separation that's being created. So intuitively, this makes sense. And uh, so what does this, so why, why do they have to be closed? So here's the reason why, why they have to be closed because if you, the basic idea is that if CI is, I'm sorry, not, yeah, closed. So if CI is connected, which it is, if CI is connected, then the closure of CI is connected. But CI is maximal, is maximal connected. It, it's not contained in anything larger that's connected. So, the, so, so CI closure has to be CI because the closure contains CI, right? The closure of a set contains the set, but the closure cannot be something bigger. It cannot be bigger because CI is already a maximal connected set. So this is connected. So if the closure of a set is equal to itself, it means so CI is closed. CI is already closed. So therefore, the connected components have to be closed subsets of X. So this is sort of the, the quick justification of the property, the properties of these components. So uh, we'll finish here.